You know what a conclusion is? A conclusion is the last thought you think when you're done thinking. It's a period at the end of the sentence. And some of you maybe have formed conclusions in your life that aren't true. Maybe you've stopped thinking. Instead of a period, maybe there should be a comma or an ellipsis. Maybe God is up to more than you think. Is there anything in your life that's so big, so overwhelming, that seems so impossible that you think God either can't or won't do it? Something that's so personal and important, but yet you've struggled or dealt with for so long that you've just kind of given up. Today, I wanna to talk to you about that one thing and wanna remind you that God does miracles every day. We have to watch for them. We have to wait for them. And when God chooses to move, we have to be ready to respond. We're in week three of our series on a generous life. And we've been talking about a, a story about how Jesus, a miracle, how he fed 5,000 men and probably 15,000 women and children. And as you know, uh, it was a miracle that was mentioned in all four of the gospels. So it was super important. And we've talked about it for three weeks now, but we're gonna continue to talk about it for the next four. And it basically goes like this. Jesus had a best friend or one of his best friends who was killed brutally. And Jesus was grieving. And so he slipped away to grieve and spend some time with his other best friends, his disciples. And as he slipped away to spend some time to grieve and to recover, to reset, crowds followed Jesus. And Jesus looked up and saw the crowd. Now in Matthew 9, Matthew 9 tells us how Jesus responds to crowds, that he looks with compassion, that he's moved in his gut and his splachna. And Jesus decided he was gonna do something for the crowd. He was gonna feed them. So he looked at Philip, one of his disciples, who was the administrator, the bean counter. He was the, the person who kept all of the business in order, most likely, um, with Jesus and his friends. And Philip needed to be challenged in his faith. Jesus looked at Philip and he said, what are we gonna do? And Philip said, too many people, not enough money, no restaurants nearby, we can't do anything, it's impossible. And so then Jesus looked around and Andrew brought a little boy with some crackers and some fish. And so we know how the story goes. Jesus took the crackers and the fish, he looked up into heaven, he gave thanks to God the Father, he broke the crackers and fish, gave them to the disciples. The disciples passed out this little lunch that this boy had brought and fed the entire crowd of 20,000 some odd people and there were baskets left over. But today we're gonna to focus on Philip, the bean counter, Philip, the dream killer, and um, remember that God can do the impossible. Now, we need administrators in our life. I am married to an administrator who likes details and schedules and sticky notes and, and she keeps things rolling. It drives me absolutely nuts sometimes because I'm not quite, oh, I'm just not wired the same way. Uh, we have uh, on, among our staff, Pastor Dan, who's responsible for the details. And sometimes we call him the dream killer because when we tell him all the things we want to do, sometimes he tells us, oh man, we can't do that because it's unwise. It's unsafe. Insurance won't cover it. It's not in the budget. But Dan always comes around to what is it that God wants us to do as we as a staff, we work through these things. Philip was being tested by God, by Jesus, and he failed the test. But I just want to know how many of you in here would kind of identify as more administrative, as detail people, as bean counters. That may be a negative way to sort of, you know, characterize you. Um, but, you know, maybe on that end of, of the spectrum, raise your hands and just let me know. Online, you guys can play along. I can't see if your hands are raised, but, it, you know, why not? There are a lot of you in here who consider yourself more administrative. How many of us would consider ourselves a little bit less that way? Okay, so we have some Phillips and maybe we have some Peters in the group, right? And Philip was somebody whose faith needed to be tested. He saw something that he just believed was too big for God. And Jesus wanted to test his faith. Jesus was in the faith stretching business. And as the disciples learned to follow Jesus and develop generous lives, they constantly had their paradigm blown up, their worldview stretched. And the impossible became possible time and time and time again. Jesus dealt with them in two ways, relationship and circumstance, which is the same way he works in our lives. And so we see in, in the miracle in John chapter six, and let's read this together, 
that Jesus is talking about physical circumstances. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And Philip answered him and he said it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. So he failed the test. Not that big a deal because Jesus is gracious. Jesus wasn't looking to give him a failing grade, just a reminder that our faith has to grow and that we can't move faster than the person we're following. But why would we want to move more quickly than the one we're following when the one we're following can do anything? And so I wanna take you to another snapshot of Jesus' life with the disciples where he talks about relationship, which can seem equally as impossible. Maybe in your life, your impossible thing, your one miracle that you would ask God for is circumstantial, financial, physical, a decision that maybe you have to make or one you'd like to be able to make. But maybe it's relational, dealing with those same concentric circles that we talked about last time. But Jesus is in the faith stretching business. And he wanted the disciples to know that he could do anything. And when you and I decide that God can't do anything, then our hope becomes hopeless. And the very faith that we have begins to shrivel and ultimately die. And so that's gonna be what we're talking about over the next few minutes. But more than that, I want it to be the thing you take with you today when you leave. So let's look together at another time when Jesus tested his disciples and their response to Jesus, it's the same response you and I have. And we find it in Luke uh, chapter 17. Now this is the middle of the section and I'm gonna read to you the point and we're gonna go back and I'm gonna set some context. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And Jesus said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Now don't get caught up in the details there. But the disciples had come to a point in their life where they said to Jesus, increase my faith. Have you ever come to a point in your life where things look impossible? Unlikely, you can't see a way out or through and you've had to pray the same prayer. Does anything come to mind? Maybe you're in the middle of something that comes to mind. Well, in this, in this section of scripture, there are four things that Jesus was teaching his disciples. And they're really important and it kind of mimics a dance step. And you might think that's a weird uh, way to think about this, but um, a little known fact that I tell very few people just because it's easy to get judged, but for some reason came to my mind this week is that back uh, in the day, a long time ago, a different day, I tried to do a lot of things to put myself through college. I got married my second year of college and was on my own. And so uh, Joy and I did whatever we could to make ends meet through college and seminary and, and everything else. And, and so I worked um, as a dance instructor at a ballroom dance school, Fred Astaire Dance School. And um, I actually, you know, applied myself and made it all the way up through the silver level and was teaching people how to ballroom dance. At the same time, I was trying to become a bounty hunter, which didn't go well. So you take those two, add them together, divide by two, and you get maybe a well-rounded person. I don't know. But there's a dance that I was thinking about when I, when I was thinking of this passage, and it's called the Foxtrot. Maybe you've seen it with Dancing with the Stars. When you look up the definition of Foxtrot, it says two people moving through a crowded room with grace. And I thought, huh, that's what Jesus was trying to do with his disciples, teaching them to move through a crowded world with grace. Thinking about the words of one of my favorite songs by Rich Mullins, who's now with the Lord. May mercy lead, may love be the strength in your legs. And with every footstep that you take, may you leave a drop of grace. And the rhythm or the pattern for the foxtrot was the exact same as the pattern or the rhythm for this passage of scripture in Jesus' teaching. Slow, Quick, quick, slow. Now there's a first step in a foxtrot. For the man, it's with the left foot. For the lady, it's with your right foot because you're facing the man. That first step is the step of faith, this slow step that Jesus assumes that they've taken. And then after that, another slow step and then a quick, quick step, which is a side together and then a slow step forward. And Jesus is teaching in this passage of scripture and he's blowing the disciples' minds. And they come to a spot where they have to say, increase our faith. 
The first thing Jesus says is be slow to offend. Offenses are gonna happen, but don't let them happen because you live like the Pharisees and the scribes and you're just an obnoxious Christian, full of judgment and hate, labeling and putting wedges between yourself and the world. Live in a way not to be offensive. Don't hate people who are different than you and realize that Jesus is for people, not against. The people are on our way and not just in our way. So the disciples, minds, poof, right? They're seeing Jesus do it, but they came from a religious system that labeled and categorized everybody. If I look at a row of people, I could try to decide by the way you look, how you're sitting, what you say, whether you deserve to be in heaven or whether you deserve to be in hell. That's what many of the Pharisees did. And Jesus says, don't do that. Be slow to offend. So the disciples are tracking with him. They're like, all right, no more hypocrisy, no more churchiness, no more impression management. Then he says, be quick to forgive. And the disciples say, man, this forgiveness thing again. What do you mean quick to forgive? He said, well, there are certain times when you have to confront, but when someone offends you, forgive them immediately and quickly. Now we've talked about forgiveness before. When you forgive someone, it doesn't mean what they did is okay. It doesn't mean that it's legal. It doesn't mean that there are cons not consequences for, for the offense. It doesn't mean that you restore a relationship with somebody. Sometimes it's not safe or wise, but it means that you release the offense and you give it to God because when you forgive, we're never more like God because God forgives and forgives freely. And the Bible tells us in the book of Mark that when we're even standing and praying or sitting and praying, that if we remember that there's something we haven't forgiven somebody for, we forgive immediately because if not, it hinders our prayers. So the disciples, their minds blown as many of yours are when we talk about the idea and issue of forgiveness. And so they call a timeout and they say, you're gonna have to increase my faith. You're asking me to do something impossible. I get the whole be slow to offend, even though it's hard, but quick to forgive. So then Jesus tells them, he said, if you have even the faith of a mustard seed, which was the smallest seed, not in the world, but the smallest seed that was used in, in their life together at that time, that you could say to the mulberry tree, which was a tree that the Pharisees said had roots that went down for 600 years, go plant yourself in the ocean and it would do it. Now the disciples aren't going around commanding trees to hop up and run down to, you know, to their roots and jump in the ocean. It was a figure of speech. Jesus was telling them that if you have faith that's planted in the right place in him and you're willing to not try to go faster than the one you're following, that a growing faith is all that he expects as he continued to blow their minds, there's nothing God can't do circumstantially, emotionally, and relationally. So you have your slow, and then you have your quick. And this third quick is be quick to ask for help. Increase my faith. Well, then he finishes this section with another slow. And he kind of looks back at his disciples and he says, when your faith starts to grow, and it will, don't think it's you that's doing it because it's not, it's me. And not for one second should you take credit for anything I do. Humility is the key to a generous life and to a growing faith. So the disciples, as they're listening to Jesus, they're like, my gosh, what in the world? How do we do this? And Jesus says, just keep going. I'm doing it in you. I'm doing it through you. So while he did miracles and rearranged the natural order of things, creating something out of nothing, defying the laws of nature, he was also creating something out of nothing 
by shaping the hearts of men and women and doing the impossible. So my question to you today is what is impossible in your life? What's the miracle that you dare pray for? Or perhaps that you've given up hope in? that you've stopped praying for, the thing that seems too big for God. Because when hope dies, faith dies. When hopelessness enters, then faithlessness accompanies it. And God's a God of hope. What's the period that you've put at the end of your sentence? What's the conclusion that you formed when you decided you were done thinking? Well, we're gonna sing a couple of songs and we're gonna come back and try to apply this in a very special way. And I've asked our pastoral staff to help me do this. And today I want you to open yourself up to the reality, to the fact that God can do anything. And then we address the question, will he? So as you can tell, Jesus did not expect Philip to do a miracle. He didn't expect Philip to solve the problem. He didn't expect Philip to be able to, to connect the dots, to even imagine how possibly something like this could ever happen. All Jesus ex expected, excuse me, from Philip is that Philip say, yeah, you can do it if you want to. I'm not sure how, Lord, but you can do it because you're a God who does things that seem impossible. And you may not be able to see how the lines could connect in your life, how you could figure out even a scenario where your one thing, your one situation, your circumstance or relationship might be okay. But Jesus does not expect you to figure out how to fix it. He just wants you to look to him and say, it's possible. Because possible, it's possible, is faith. It's hope. It's the life of a disciple. Now, the thing in your life, if you've thought of something, and maybe it's for someone else, not just you, when you let it out, when you let go of control and at least open up your mind and your heart to the possibility that God may do something, it can be a little scary. Because even if it's the most painful thing in your life, the thing that you want more than anybody else or anything else, for God to actually do what it is that you think you want, what's well, gonna cause you to respond? And sometimes that gets us way out of our comfort zone. I was thinking earlier about a friend of mine. He was one of my best friends at a different state in a different time who wasn't a believer. His wife prayed with other women for a long time that he would become a Christian. And over time he did. But the problem was that he got genuinely saved and became a genuine disciple of Jesus Christ. And he loved the Lord even more than he loved his wife, which is the only order where it really works. And as he started serving the Lord with his wife, and doing the kinds of things that God was wanting him to do, she decided she didn't really like him being a Christian after all. And they ended up not making it. So we have to be willing to acknowledge the fact that when we pray that God does a miracle, and if he does, that you're ready to follow through and be the person that that person or circumstance needs. It occurred to me last week that I set a standard for you guys that the Bible sets, but I thought maybe I had overwhelmed you a little bit. Several times, especially on Sunday afternoon, when I'm usually filled with regret, the things I wish I said, or the things I wish I'd said differently, or you know whatever it is that preachers deal with, we uh, deal with on Sunday afternoons. But it came back again on Monday and then on Tuesday. And I thought, you know, I think maybe I, I laid out God's standard in such a way that disconnected from you, where you thought that it was impossible, where maybe it overwhelmed you, frustrated, discouraged you. And the thing is that none of it's possible without God. And that was Jesus' point with Philip and with the disciples as he was teaching them, you know, how to forgive and not be offensive and not take the credit. It's that only with God are things possible and that God does miracles, but it's not us that does it. It's 
us giving ourselves to the Lord. And we started last week with concentric circles and we talked about how we serve people who are closest to us and we work itself or it works itself out in our life, ultimately impacting our community. And I started with marriage. If we're married, the people closest to us or possibly somebody you're engaged to or a boyfriend or a girlfriend, a relationship. But I think I skipped a circle and that would be the epicenter, you in your own personal life. And, and I was thinking about this this week and I thought, you know, for some people, the one thing that you would ask God to do a miracle in, the biggest request, desire of your heart has to do with the things that exist within you. It could be a depression, it could be an anxiety, it could be a loneliness that's causing you to make decisions that have consequences. It could be a question about why you're here and what's next. And then as we move out to that next circle and I talk to you about marriage and talk to you about how marriages work in God's economy and how we are called to serve our spouse, even if it never makes us happy, that um, we have to give 100% of ourselves to them regardless of whether they go first. And that if we're not happy for the rest of our lives, it really doesn't matter because our happiness is secondary to us serving the Lord and doing what's right. And I thought maybe I'd laid this standard out in such a way that you just felt overwhelmed and just thought it was impossible because things like that are so hard. We want the other person to go first. We want them to deserve it. We want to think that happiness comes at the end when sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And regret can be a powerful motivator and many of us have regret over things in the past. But Jesus is a God who is concerned about right now and what you do next. Now he'll help you deal with the past. But what I'm talking about is what happens next. I talked about parenting, kids that are at home and kids that aren't. And how as we serve our children and we are faithful and generous in our faith with them, that we protect their lives by creating margin in their lives trying to protect them from some of the things that may instill or install the wrong kinds of values in them. That we, even if they hate our guts for a while, realize that we're the parent and they're the child and that we're responsible for who they are and where they are. That even as they grow and leave the home, that our number one priority is to create them or to at least encourage them to be prepared to meet Jesus and to leave a, an impact, a legacy on this earth that goes far beyond their career but that really makes a difference for eternity. Impossible, overwhelming. Maybe your one thing has to do with your children. Then we moved out one other level and we talked about our closest friends. And then we talked about our workplace and coworkers and people we work under and people maybe who work for us. And that can involve finances and security in the future and we talked about church and how God's called us to serve the church, but for a purpose that we're called to serve the Lord through the church. And so as we think about our one thing, what I want you to do right now is in your own way to think your thought toward God, your prayer. And I want you to tell him, even though it seems impossible to me, you can. I don't know if you will, but you can. I see you working in other people's lives and I know you can and have worked in my life. And even though this is the deepest longing of my heart, you can, because that's where hope is born and hope leads to faith. And God has a way of growing our faith, just like that mustard seed. So what I want to do now is I want to ask our, our pastoral staff to come and um, we're going to pray for you for a minute. And I don't know what your thing is, but I want you to be in the same spot when we leave today as Jesus wanted Philip to be. Not to figure out how to solve your problems or the problems in somebody else's life that may be your one thing that you're hurting over but you just look to the Lord and acknowledge the fact that, that he can. So I've asked him to pray for you. 
And I'll close this in prayer in just a minute. And then we'll sing a song to seal the deal with God. And we'll walk away from here. I trust different than the way we came in. Dan. Heavenly Father, as we come to pray with our friends, our family, those that are here, those that are online, Lord, to just uh, in my heart of hearts, you know, marriage is a big deal. Lori and I have walked through that, know it full well. And so for those, Lord, today who are praying this impossible prayer, that they're not sure their marriage will even survive, their spouse, their significant other is even aware, much less involved in their marriage. So Lord, I just, uh, with my friends, pray with them, intercede on their behalf today. That if they're alone, if they feel like they're in a survival mode, that you would absolutely encourage their faith. That you would help them to hold on to the lies that the enemy wants to speak into our lives, cast them out to replace them with truth as much as we may think that it's over we think that there's a period versus a comma. Lord, King David prayed in Second Samuel that you would burst through. And that is my prayer when it comes to marriage. Lord, and from Genesis to Ephesians, the picture of salvation and relationship with you, it is intimate. And Lord, in marriage, we know it is unbelievably hard to walk through the words, the threats, the actions, the pain. But Lord, Colossians reminds us that we are forgive as you forgave. And while that humanly is hard, Lord, as followers of Jesus, it's not an option. God, I'm just convinced and convicted as I pray with my friends day over marriage that you would call men to actually lead as Genesis and Ephesians 5 points out. It's easy to protect and provide for our family, but Lord, you remind us that we're supposed to be the responsible party pointing our marriage and our family towards Jesus above all else. And Lord, I pray, I pray for hope. As we've been listening to the story, Lord, of how you took two fish, and Lord, I pray for two lives, that we surrender that crazy, hard, deep thing that we, we in our flesh don't think it's survivable. Lord, may we be reminded today that you take two lives like you took two fish and you didn't just fix a need. You blessed it in such a way they were filled. They were, in fact, they were, they were overflowing, which just reminds us, Lord, that you do things that we can not think <laughs> that are imaginable that can happen. You absolutely are the God of the impossible. So would you speak words of hope to those in those relationships today in Jesus' name. Father, we come today uh, praying for courage. Lord, courage to uh, take this step in trusting you, giving you these situations. Um, Lord, often, even for myself, when we've faced impossibility for long enough, we've grown comfortable. It's become the status quo. And Lord, there is a, there's always the, the unknown of what if I do this? What if I trust God? What does it require of me? And Lord, I just pray for courage again uh, for those here. And Lord, just praying as they, as they face those situations, as they trust you with them, Lord, that they would have the courage to turn those over to you and to be willing to follow Lord, it's entirely up to you to fix those situations. Lord, you're going to do the work for those. Um, and it's just up to us to, to trust and to follow in those. And Lord, again, I, again, even for myself, praying for the courage to give those situations up and be willing to follow you as you uh, bring about change, Lord, if you choose to do so. Lord, the... Uh, the unknown in those situations is, is scary. And uh, Lord, again, just praying for the peace, the comfort, and the courage to trust and hand those situations to you. Lord, that uh, we know sometimes it requires us to change too as we're uh, working through relationships or uh, 
reconciling different things, Lord, whatever those impossible things are uh, to each person. Uh, Lord, again, just pray that you would strengthen us, encourage us, and uh, again, Lord, just provide the, the support and stability we need to hand those over to you. And Lord, we just thank you for loving us. We thank you for your son, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Lord, it can often be easy to pray for what others need or things that they have asked for prayer for. We can come to you and on their behalf. And Lord, it's not always easy to ask for the things that we know we need. And sometimes it's because our pride gets in the way and we're just afraid to ask. Other times, Lord, it's because we just don't think you can do it. And Lord, I know there are people in this room today who need to take that step of faith and just know that, Lord, you can do it. They need to lay whatever it is that is burdening them, Lord, whether it be regret, whether it be anxiety, whether it be depression, whether it be an addiction, Lord, whatever it is that they are holding on to so tightly and for whatever reason that they will not and have not let it go, whether it, it be that pride, whether it be that desire to have control of it, Lord, I just pray that today they will make that decision to lay it at your feet, to give you full control of it, to know that when they take that step of faith, Lord, the peace that comes from that is overwhelming. And Lord, it's what you want for us. You love us so much. And you want us to come to that place where we can just give it all to you and stop trying to take control of the things that we can't, we can't handle, that we can't do alone. Lord, we need you. And I just pray today that we would take that step and that we would give it all to you. It's in your name we pray. God, I want to lift up the parents, single parents, grandparents here in this room, tuning in online as well. <clears throat> God, I especially want to lift up the parents that are have kids that, that aren't near them, aren't in proximity to them, but God, maybe they have kids that, that aren't near you as well. Just for a moment, God, I want them to know that they're not alone in this prayer. I want them to know that they're not alone in praying for their kids. God, I pray that a miracle happens in their relationship, in their relationship with their parents, but also in a, re a miracle happens in their relationship with you. That as they go about work, church, wherever it is that you have them to be, that they run into someone who points them to you, that loves them the way that you would love them. God, I just pray, pray for hope for these parents. Pray that you give them a faith, a small faith to, to just pray the prayer one more day. And God, as, as a church, I pray that, that we remember that there are people around us that we can be pointing them to Jesus. We could be the answer to that prayer as we live out this generous life. God, I pray that we find hope in, in that, find our role in that. You're a generous God, and I pray that you generously shower these children with prayers, or with love. God, I pray that you hear our prayers. Pray that you give us hope, because we know that you're a God who can. In your name we pray, amen. Father, as we close the time together, I just pray that um, you would reveal to us a couple of things. One, that you would reveal to us the true desire of our heart. That number two, that you would just give us a supernatural confidence in you and in the fact that you control all of the contingencies in life, that you know everything and nothing surprises you. But even though sometimes we wait for a person or a circumstance, when we have hope in you, that frees us up to live a generous life and to be the person or help create the circumstance that you use in someone else's life to answer their prayer, to be part of a miracle, just like Philip and Andrew and the rest of the disciples. I pray for my friends right now, Father, and I love them and I want this freedom for them more than anything else right now in this moment, this morning. Because we can't move on until we take care of this with you. 
So whether our thing is our own or whether our thing is for somebody else, we acknowledge together with confidence, you can. We can't see it, but we don't have to. You can. And in that, we find hope. And that hope brings peace. And that peace gives us the space in our life for our mustard seed of faith to grow, to become uncommon, and most importantly, to spill over and to affect the world around us in the best possible way. So that's our prayer today, Father. We love you. We expect you to do great things.